This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Start building your website today at squarespace.com. Enter offer code STUFF at checkout and you'll get 10% off. Squarespace, build it beautiful. On the road again. That's right, up to uh, the Northeast. We just can't wait to get on the road again. That's right, June 22nd to 26th. Going places that uh, we've been before. Yeah, we're going to go to places like Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Durham, D.C. We just can't wait to get on the road again. And for more information, go to SYSKLive.com. Hey, thanks to HowStuffWorks.com and our buddies at Squarespace for powering our SYSK Live website. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant. Oh, get, get, you're imprinting all over me. Stop. Is that, what, is that what I'm doing? Yeah, you're rubbing your feathers all over me. Mm-hmm. I've got a feather with, duster that po- I'm tickling you with. Poking me with your beak. Yeah. I'm not your parents, you know. That's right. Thank God. What a weird intro that was. Yeah, that was and scene. Mm-hmm. And it's called animal imprinting. I'm sure we've talked about this before, but is it and scene or end scene? We it, need Joe Randazzo to weigh in on this one. No, we don't. It's and scene. Um, sure. Common. I'm positive we have talked about this. and I know we have, but I don't remember the outcome. Well, it was me saying it's and scene for sure, and you're going, you sure? That's why we're talking <laughs> about it again. Yeah. Okay. It's and scene. So animal imprinting. Mm-hmm. It's a thing. It is. It's a... Uh, in the strictest definition, it is only for birds. Yeah, and specific type of birds called precocial birds. Yeah, they are very precocial. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that means that they hatch out of the egg and look around and start waddling, and they're like, oh, look, this is water. I, th- I have this weird innate urge to get in there and swim. Yeah. And, um, uh, oh, here's a little bit of um, duck food. I think I'll eat some of that because yeah. I have a drive to do that. But what is that wonderful smell? Oh, I think this might be the duck that gave birth to me or laid me as an egg, and now I'm going to imprint myself on you. It's either that or it's a grown human man. Yeah, it can be anything, especially with ducks, but especially specifically precocial birds have a process where they form an attachment to a parent. And it's been yeah. shown over time that that parent doesn't necessarily have to be a biological parent. It can not even be in the same species. It doesn't even have to be a living thing. No. It can be a toy train. Yes, it can be, or a pair of gumboots. Yeah. Um, and humans have known for a very long time about this process. It just wasn't until like the 1900s that we started to get a um, a real grip on it. But like apparently in uh, there's a Roman treatise around... I guess like the 30s, in the real 30s, I mean like 30 CE. Not 1930s. No, like 30. Not the swinging 30s. Um, and it's it basically says like if you want to train some wild ducks, go get yourself some duck eggs, put them under a hen that you have domesticated, mm-hmm. and that hen will raise those ducks as their own, and they'll be unwild. Yeah, and in, uh, in rural China, back in the day, rice farmers would imprint new ducks with a stick so they could then use that stick to guide them out to their uh, rice population where they would eat snails. Right, the rice population. So they're fo- literally <laughs> following this stick around like it's their parents. Yeah. So they would lead them to uh, to help to work for them, basically. And the whole thing is, is the stick was what they were introduced to at a very specific time in their life, mm-hmm. uh, usually within a couple hours, and they said... Stick, you're my mom. Yeah. I'm going to follow you everywhere. It's when you're so not around, weird. I'm going to freak out. It's so weird. Uh, yeah. It's, and, and ducks are a really great um, – they're like a classic example of imprinting because they're very emotional creatures. Mm-hmm. Um, and they form very strong attachments. And they're very social creatures. So either they're all those things because – they form very strong imprinted bonds, mm-hmm. or they form very strong imprinted bonds because of all those things. Yeah. Well, I think it's natural selection at work. Oh, show. So that's a that's the at the heart of this whole thing is, you know, is it nature versus nurture? Yeah. And imprinting is a really great natural experiment to investigate the whole thing. And what it seems like we found is that it's both. Yeah. 
that apparently, especially specifically, precocial ducks are hardwired to go seek out and form an attachment. Yeah. But depending on what they encounter at the time, e.g. their environment, also known as nurture, um, they can form that attachment with a stick. Yeah, or a toy train. Or a Nazi. <laughs> yeah. It's very cute, actually, when you think about it. You know, they're just like, love me, whatever. Yeah, right. Pu- hand puppet. What was that Dr. Seuss book? I think it was Love Me Hand Puppet. <laughs> <laughs> no? I think it was Are You My Mother? I don't know. Never heard that. Like, Horton makes an appearance in it? It's like oh, some yeah? animals walking around like, are you my mother? Real- or, yeah. God, that's awful. It is pretty sad. But it's, yeah. it's basically a Dr. Seuss book about imprinting. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Well, you mentioned Nazis. So, to me, that's my cue to segue into the life of Conrad with a K, Lorenz, who was uh, Austrian. Yep. Born at the turn of the century in 1903. And um, he was big into animals and he studied regular medicine and then decided this is great humans are fun but i'm really into studying animals and their behaviors right that was his bag so he became a zoologist he did he got a phd in 1933 and started work uh alongside oscar heinroth who was a fellow scientist Mm -hmm. with uh what was he austrian or german i'm not sure he's probably one of the two well, so Lawrence is working. He's already established himself as a scientist when the Nazis come marching into town. Yeah, and um, literally one of the things, yeah, one mm-hmm. of the things he had to answer for years later, when he won the Nobel Prize for his imprinting work, was his um, zeal and enthusiasm, basically, with which he welcomed the conquering Nazis. Yeah, and took his ideas about domestication and applied them to. The, the lens of Nazi theory yeah. about race. Like, Conrad Lawrence was a racist in the purest and vilest form of the word. Yes. it's it, There's no escaping that. No, and he uh, he flat out denied even being a party member until it was proven, and then he was like, oh, I oh, was. I forgot about that membership. And, and he very much tried to, to wiggle his way out of that years later um, by saying, you know, I think what it, how it ends up is he's not the only academic that was on the wrong side of history. No, certainly back not. Then. And, and he came out years later and sort of like, oh, yeah, but I sort of got swept up. I didn't really mean it in this way. Mm-hmm. And science is kind of divided. Some people forgave him and others did not. Yeah, and it's um, I think science as a whole has forgiven him largely, mm-hmm. yeah. like science with a capital S. Uh-huh. But there are plenty of scientists out there who are like, the guy was a Nazi. And he used his theories – to help the Nazi regime. Yeah. Like he was a Nazi psychologist in Austria who um, was paid to examine um, German Polish uh, people. Yes. And and basically determine that like the the um, mating of a German person and a mm-hmm. Polish person produces undesirable offspring. Well, you throw that out into the Nazi void and see what they do with that info. Yeah, they're not going to be mating with Polish people. So this guy is is he was a um, an evolutionary theorist of a, a a very brilliant magnitude, sure, great zoologist, but also a Nazi. And a lot of people call into question like the work that he produced. Yeah. Um, but again, as a whole, science seems to have forgiven him for the most part. Yeah, that's a that's a great sort of a COA. It's more like the more you know type of thing. <laughs> you got to make the star. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, that aside, let's get back to his work with Oscar Heinroth. Um, they were contemporaries, and Heinroth, he was actually the first dude, uh, even though he didn't call it imprinting at the time, he used the German word uh, prügung. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Like an A with a pneumat, sort of a U. U? Prügung. Oh, that's good. That sounded Swedish chef though. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably get taken to task, but for my <laughs> memory of German in college, that's right on the money. So, uh, like I said, he didn't call it imprinting at the time, but he did study the uh, gray lag geese and found out that right out of the egg that they um, can attach to humans. And it was a big, you know, although they did it in Rome in ancient China, Germans probably thought they made it that up. Right. They discovered it first. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, another thing that Lawrence is criticized for, aside from the Nazi affiliation, was that he was um, 
he very readily made an anthrop what's called an anthropic shift. Yeah, where he took his findings ab- about animals and was very eager to extrapolate them onto humans. Yeah, as well. Which uh, some people are like, whoa, whoa, buddy, you haven't you haven't shown that connection yet. Yeah, you can't. You know, that doesn't always work. No, but there there has we'll see like come to there's a there's an understanding that. Yeah, there's something similar in humans and other mammals, too, Yeah, as we'll talk about. Uh, so there was one experiment early on where he took some goose eggs and separated them out uh, into the control and the experiment uh, experimental group. And, of course, the experimental, he raised separate from the mother completely. All this sounds kind of mean, too, by the way. Yeah, so all imprinting exper- ex- experiments are about as immoral as they get. Yeah, it's like ripping the baby right out of the egg or womb uh, away from its mother. Right, and, and saying like... Just to see what happens. Right, like, here, this gumboot is your mother. Yeah. Try growing up normal and socialized <laughs> with a gumboot for a mom. No, agreed. You know? Yeah. Almost across the board, these animal, these are um, immoral, unethical experiments. Agreed. So the experimental geese only met with him, uh, not the goose mom at all. And then eventually, to test this out, what he did was he put them... Uh, he put the groups together, marked them, put them under a box, and then basically, sort of like the old uh, experiment, like Brady Bunch thing, to see who calls the dog, which one the dog will come <laughs> oh, yeah, to. I forgot about that. He had someone lift the box. He's on one side of the room. The goose is on the other, and the ones who he had raised came straight to him. Yeah, which I'll bet when they lifted that box, it was adorable—a bunch of confused <laughs> ducklings yeah. looking around, like, "What was that?" Right, you're my mommy, the right? M- Nazi man, right. <laughs> The bearded Nazi is my mom. Uh, so he finally named it uh, filial, filial imprinting. I think filial. Filial imprinting. Yeah, and it's basically exactly what it sounds like. It's that if you if you imprint, if you introduce something or yourself to a precocial bird at a certain stage of development, it will say you're my parent, right? Yeah, and he initially called that the critical period, right? Is the amount of time you had to do that. Yeah, so he um his studies weren't quite as um like well designed as later studies, but yeah. he basically said like he assumed probably first 10 minutes, maybe an hour after hatching is this critical period. And then he also took it a step farther by saying it's irreversible. Yeah. So once once this duckling thinks the gum boot is its mom, it's always going to think You're stuck that. with that duck until you eat it. So Lawrence like really put a lot out there and he really moved evolutionary biology ahead to a degree. Yeah. Ethology is the field that he helped found. Yeah. Um but we'll talk about some follow up studies that supported and overturned some of his findings right after this. People, we know you're going to snack. You we get hungry it. at work, and you're going to dive for that bag of chips That's right. and that candy bar. That's right. And it's going to make you puff up like a big balloon. And you're going to feel pretty bad afterward. That's right. But what you should do instead is reach for the Nature Box. You can choose from over 100 healthy and crave-worthy options, and they're delivered right to your door. Yep, and all of their snacks are made with zero artificial flavors, colors, or sweeteners, zero grams trans fats, and no high-fructose corn syrup. And best of all, they taste Amazing. They do, man. They taste really good. I personally can uh, lobby for the mini Belgian waffles <laughs> yeah, I'm right and there the with strawberry you. lemonade fruit stars. Yeah, and don't forget the sweet and salty nut medley. Mm. Yeah. So good. So right now, if you go to naturebox.com slash stuff, you can get a free trial of your favorite snacks. That's right. Free snacks delivered to your door. What are you waiting for? That rhymes. It does. Go to naturebox.com slash stuff and start your free trial today. So, Chuck, um, Lawrence comes up with uh, f- filial imprinting, right? Yeah. Then later studies in like the 50s and 60s, um, especially by a guy named Eckhart Hess and A.O. Ramsey, who built a lab in Maryland specifically dedicated to studying animal imprinting. And they had really great controlled conditions. 
And yes. they, they really refined Lawrence's findings. Yeah, and they studied uh, mallard ducklings, again, with the ducks. And um, <laughs> they found that the most sensitive period was 13 to 16 hours after hatching, which was uh, higher, more hours than I think Lorenz had found, correct? Yeah. I he, think he had it down to like three or four hours, right? Tops, yeah. And this was, I guess the, the duckling likes to have a little time to swim around and get some food yeah. and maybe take a rest, and then it'll start getting down to imprinting. Yeah, and he, um, I thought this was super interesting. They also found that the ducklings that had to go, th- like jump through more hurdles and go through more to find the uh, the parent formed a stronger attachment. Mm-hmm. Which kind of makes sense. Like you worked harder for it. Right. I guess. It's like that Morrissey song. The more you ignore me, the closer I get. <laughs> Man, he's the best. The best. Yeah. Also the worst as far as like <laughs> canceling shows and like, yeah. I mean, dude cannot like, I don't know Had if he's that. ever completed a full tour. There's no way. He's like, oh, I have a headache. Like every Morrissey tour, eventually, if you're on the end of that tour, you might as well not even have tickets. Yeah. Because you're not going to be seeing Morrissey. All right. That's my little soapbox about Morrissey. (laughs) Finish your tour. (laughs) That's right. You, me, and I had that happen to us. Oh, you had Morrissey tickets? See? Mm -hmm. Ugh. Was it recently? It was within the last, like, two years. He should call every tour, like, the Morrissey... Potential tour. Potential tour. Or first <laughs> half tour. Yeah. Uh, so back to the ducklings. Uh, they also found that um, they would imprint onto little paper mache ducks that they made. Yeah. Which is very sweet. Colored balls. Yeah. Uh, colored more than the white ones. Yeah. Which is interesting. Uh, I guess, I don't know, they must react to color more. Even though well, that's, that... vi- vision wasn't really a part. I thought it was just sound. It depends. Smell and uh, touch. So there's a um, there's a PBS Nature special called um, My Life as a Turkey, and it's about a, a researcher who is studying animal imprinting and specifically yeah. with turkeys. I read that one. Turkeys have astounding vision. Yeah. Um, just amazing vision. Like they can spot like um, a screw head from a football field away. <laughs> That's small. How do you know? Did they say screw head? Right. Well, yeah, they're known for going and rooting out screw heads at far long distances. Wow. They just stop and point. Like a pig with, in the truffles. Right, exactly. Yeah. That's what turkeys are used for. Um, but uh, So a turkey has very great vision. So I could see color being an environmental cue. I guess so. Smell. Movement. Touch the is three a big huge ones. one. Yeah. That's a big one. All right. So another thing they tried that did not work, which I thought was interesting, is going back even before they hatched and using auditory cues in the egg, and they found that didn't make any difference. But it's a good thing to test. The guy on the nature thing, though, found the opposite. Oh, really? Yeah, he um, he would talk turkey to to the eggs. Oh, I thought he talked turkey once they were born. No, he's, while they were eggs, he talked turkey to get them used to it. All right. Yeah. And that was a pretty good turkey trick. <laughs> Thank you. And then um, after that, uh, when they were when they were hatched, they uh, he talk turkey again to them and apparently they came right over oh okay but smells also a big one too oh yeah huge the inside of the egg probably smells a lot like the mom yeah you know that makes sense so all these environmental cues add up to what the what this little hatchling is basically mindlessly following because again all of this imprinting stuff has found that animals at least are hardwired to go seek out and form these these attachments. Yes, and they also found that their uh, that critical period was even longer when they kept them isolated from birth. So if they kept them completely socially isolated, they would have up to 20 hours yeah. uh, to imprint. And this uh, caused a researcher named, oh boy, uh, Vladislav. 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 Slukin. Great name. <laughs> he said it's actually not a critical period. Let's call it a sensitive period. <laughs> right. Semantics, if you ask me. Yeah, but it, it makes a pretty good point. It's basically saying, like, this thing is not, yes, it appears to be hardwired, but it's also malleable in, in the face of nurture, yeah. in the face of the environment. Sure. It can be postponed. It can be um, altered. Uh, it's not nature versus nurture. It's nature and nurture in conjunction with one another. That's right. And so, 
All of this filial imprinting that Lawrence first identified and really started systematically studying and that was later carried on in birds um, also led to the discovery that birds also um, imprint sexually as well as filially. Hey yeah. Yes. And depending on what they attach to filially, they will um, their sexual attachments or sexual preferences will also be altered later on in life. Right. As they mature. So in other words, a bird that is raised by a human okay. will eventually try and mate with humans. Yes. Even in the presence of other birds of that species. Right. Crazy. Yes, and the reason why, they think, is because um, the bird is basically identifying with what it's taking as its own species, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it will say, well, my parent is a human, ergo I must be a human, right? and therefore I want to get with a human. Yeah, it's a very confused bird. Right, but... There's something that they've also found that refines this whole thing even further, and that is that sexual imprinting is basically blocked. They're sexually blind is what they call it mm -hmm. to the person that raised them. Yes. So while they might be attracted to humans, they're not going to be attracted to their human parent. Right. And there's actually something which um, we should do an incest episode. We should. Um, that sounds like it's uh, you just pulled that out of thin air, but it's remarkably similar. Yeah, there's something that's been noted in humans called the Westmark effect, which we'll have to do an incest episode, but it's super interesting. Yeah, agreed. Especially coming from like um like a clinical standpoint or viewpoint. Yeah, sure. And not just like let's do a show on incest. Ooh, gross. The right. end. Right. You know, look at it sociologically. <laughs> that sounds like a stuff you should know episode. Uh back to the birds, uh another interesting finding here when they were when they studied uh, the sexual imprinting initially, it was with jackdaws, which are sort of like crows. Okay. And they found that there were different types of imprinting occurring as they mature. So, in other words, uh, one of those jackdaws ate with humans, mm -hmm. flew with crows, but mated with jackdaws. Right. So, that suggests that... They were partying, dude. <laughs> there are these... Um, it's a well-rounded jackdaw. Yeah. The, but it suggests that there are the, the different sensitive periods... Rather than just one, right? Fourteen to sixteen hours after hatch, hatching, That's right? right? Um, and it, it, you maybe you have a filial imprinting, like pretty early on. That's the first one, and then sexual imprinting comes after that. Who knows? Who knows? Um, well, we'll talk more about. Remember, I said Lorenz is, was accused of making the anthropic shift a little too soon. Sure. Well, he was vindicated to a large extent, because a lot of this does apply to mammals as well. We'll talk about that right after this. Chuck, mm -hmm. you ever walk into a bank and go, stick them up? Just kidding. I want a loan. Yeah, they don't think that's very funny anymore. No, they don't. But... If you want a loan, there's a better way to do that than just by being sassy in a bank. It's called Prosper.com, and it is turning the lending industry on its head. That's right. Prosper's innovative online marketplace connects people who need money with those who have money to invest. So everyone prospers. Kind of makes sense. You borrow up to $35,000 at a low fixed rate, and you never have to set foot in that bank. That's right. And Prosper's investors get solid returns, monthly cash flow, and a diversified portfolio that empowers others. So to check your rate instantly without affecting your good credit, go to prosper.com slash stuff. And for a limited time, people, listeners to this show will get a $50 Visa gift card when you get a loan. That's right. Up to $35,000 in your account in three days and a $50 Visa gift card. Go to prosper.com slash stuff. That's prosper.com slash stuff. Before we talk about mammals, there was this quote that I meant to read before the last break. He talked about the guy who talked turkey, Joe Hutto. Uh -huh. And uh, he has a quote. He said, um, when the when the first poult emerged, he made uh, his turkey sound. Mm -hmm. And as Joe recounts, the poult turned his head, its eyes met Joe's, and, quote, something very unambiguous happened in that moment, quote. <laughs> True love. Isn't that cute? It is cute, but a little creepy. 
<laughs> you know, he's like, you know, we met, our eyes met, and from it was across the room, and it was unambiguous. Yeah. So anyway, sorry about. That. I just had to throw that in there. Nice. Joe Hutto, Turkey Lover. Yeah, go watch My Life as a Turkey on PBS. Uh, I'd say Turkey Lover and Jess. He was a scientist. Oh well, yeah. Oh, no, he's not a creep. No, creeps don't use words like unambiguous to describe connection. No. They know? say, get in my van. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so mammals. Um, this is not exactly, strictly speaking, imprinting, but they've sort of expanded over the years the definition right. to include, you know, like what happens if you rip a monkey away from its mom. Which has been done. Yes. By a guy named Harry Harlow in the 50s and 60s. Yeah. One of the more despicable scientists involved in animal testing. As a matter of fact, Harlow's tests with um, filial imprinting among mammals and monkeys in particular mm -hmm. um, led to the animal rights movement. It definitely gave it steam and a lot of public support after um, articles and news stories were released about Harlow. And when he was vilified, he did not buckle under public opinion. Mm -hmm. He is very famously quoted as, who could ever love a monkey? Um, everybody but you. That's what he said <laughs> in response to being criticized. Who could ever love a monkey? Like, what's your problem, idiots? It's a monkey. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I don't get that. So, there I are mean, people out there like that, though. That sure, but like, they shouldn't be in charge of running tests about filial imprinting with monkeys. They can just agreed. sit there on the sidelines and... Hate animals. Yeah, or watch TV <laughs> or something. Yeah, agreed. Um, watch... Uh, what was the Broderick movie about monkey testing? Oh, uh, Project X. Yeah, that one. Yeah, just watch that on a loop. I'll bet the working title was Monkey See, Monkey Do. <laughs> oh, you're probably right. Um, all right, so back to mammals, right? Yes. Um, they did some studies in the 1990s, a researcher named Keith Kendrick, where they, uh, and this one doesn't seem like too much of a stretch, they switched sheep and goats at birth, and... Um, they were allowed contact, social contact with their own species, but they were raised by their adoptive parents, uh, like the baby sheep was raised by the goat. Yeah. But they were still allowed to commingle with other sheep. Right. And it still worked. It turned out that they preferred to mate with the species of the adopted parent. Right. Or adopted mother. But they also found very um, remarkably or notably that it's reversible as well. Yes. They wanted to see how it would hold up. Right. So once a year, they would bring them all back together, be like, mingle. Yeah. Have uh, some, there's some a cheese plate over there. Well, yeah, We're this is. play a little music. This is after, right, after they had removed them from the opposite species, put them back with their own species, and once a year they said, hey, remember those goats that you like so much? Oh, it was like that, huh? Yeah. Okay, so and what they found was that among females, we can say females because we're talking about a different species. That's right. Um, the females showed a preference. They reverted to their intra-species preference. So yeah. like they, they showed like a sexual preference for their own species after about one to three years after being returned. Yes. Right? Yes. But males, even after three years of being um, ming commingled again, yeah. they still showed a preference for the species that they'd imprinted on. Yeah, they like the goats were still like, oh, man, I remember those sheep. Right, like, and the sheep I, I, said I look, the same thing about the goats, which is I look is forward noteworthy. to Sheep Day once a year. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Where we can go party. Sheep Day. They have um, the best cheese plate. Oh, man. Uh, I thought that was really interesting, though, how, uh, I mean, there's no explanation, I guess, but how the, the females and the males reacted, you know, years later. Well, males are stubborn. Yeah. Think. Maybe that's all it is. Yeah. Not not quite as agile is another way to put it. <laughs> so that's sheep and goats. Yes. The, the experiment's called the old switcheroo. Um, Harry Harlow did some experiments, and he actually, um, as mean as his experiments were, he actually managed to basically disprove an ongoing debate that had been ongoing up until that point. Yeah. Um, whether or not you form an attachment or animals form an attachment based on classical conditioning mm -hmm. or based on some sort of um, evolutionary mechanism. Right. And so the classical conditioning people said, no, no, all it's, it's all about food. So the animal 
goes up and imprints on whatever is giving it food. Right. And what it's doing is it's making an, an imprint, an attachment with the person that gives it food. So you're, you're looking for the food and you insert the person who gives you the food and then you can remove the food and you still have the attachment to the person that gave you the food. Yeah. Classical conditioning. It's just standard Freud stuff, right? Yeah, I punch that button, food, cocaine comes out. Exactly. Well, that's more skinnery, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, conditioning. Uh-huh. Um, so with Harlow's experiments, he took monkeys, stri- stripped them from their mothers. Mm-hmm. In some cases, let them get nice and attached to their mothers and then stripped them to- from their mothers. Yeah, nice guy. Had all sorts of different designs. But basically the upshot was he introduced them to two different mothers. They were both inanimate objects. One was a monkey mother made of like wire with like spikes. It was a toaster. <laughs> they, they well, they referred to it as the Iron Maiden. Yeah, but this one had food. Mm-hmm. The other one was a inanimate monkey mother who was made of terry cloth and was soft. Yeah, a little bit like a teddy bear, a monkey teddy bear. So to a monkey, all of these monkeys showed a preference for the terry cloth monkey mother of course they would go to this wire monkey mother when they were hungry and mm-hmm. would eat and they would immediately go back to the monkey mother when harry harlow came in it was like blah, 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 and would scare them all yeah they would all go over to the the terry cloth mother so he basically showed that it's not food right and it, by extension it's not classical conditioning it's softness it's it's <laughs> comfort it's contact exactly it may be physical protection but apparently it is um it's it's contact and to make an anthropic shift, you can extrapolate that onto humans too. Yeah. Because there's a drug called oxytocin that is released, um, especially on skin to skin contact, which is why touching and raising um, an infant and holding an infant yeah. is extraordinarily important, not just for its development, but also for establishing bonds and contact with the, with that kid. Yeah, and especially uh, for adoptive parents, they say a lot of skin-on-skin contact mm-hmm. as soon as possible right. is key to establishing that bond. But that's really neat because it means like the, the, the imprinting mm-hmm. is all about it, – it, it basically proves family is what you make of it. Yeah. Or family is whatever you find – is your family? Yeah, it does. It's not this predefined structure. It's from a from infancy. It's whatever you make of it. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and then you know Harlow was uh, I like him less and less the more you talk about him. Yeah. But on the other side of the spectrum, what we've learned through all this research is if you work in wildlife conservation, um, they're not just willy nilly in how they handle animals anymore. Right. Uh, they go through great pains and efforts to. Uh, like we mentioned the hand puppet, you know, they have Operation Condor mm-hmm. where they will raise these baby condors who are abandoned and they would dress their their hand puppet up to look like a mama condor to feed it. Yeah. And basically to do everything they can do to make sure that they can live a regular life in the wild. Right. And they're not looking for that iron spiked iron maiden in the jungle. Yeah. Uh, and it, even down to like migratory patterns, they'll use like the ultralight planes yeah. to later teach these birds and they will dress up the plane to look like uh, a condor or whatever, a duck, <laughs> and you know, fly, uh, you know, the the migratory pattern that they should that they should use the route. <laughs> yeah, and there's one of the researchers is inside the glider that's dressed <laughs> up like a condor. Yeah. on the PA going, follow me. <laughs> and the cutest thing ever, um, they found out that in, uh, I think it was in Japan, that pandas. Um, didn't do so well when they were handled by humans too young. Yeah. So now they wear panda suits. Yeah. Isn't that adorable? Yes, it is. It's like you go to work, you punch in, you put on your panda suit, mm-hmm. and you cuddle with baby pandas. Well, that and it, it's not just human contact that can screw up, like, say, a panda. Yeah. Um, what they found is uh, one of the things that Harlow found was that um, imprinting has a lot to do with socialization. Yeah. So that even if you just stick a baby with the wire, spiky, Iron Maiden monkey mother, yeah. but you give that monkey 20 minutes a day to socialize with other monkeys, mm-hmm. it should turn out okay. Okay. But even if it has the terry cloth mother and is kept in isolation from other monkeys, yeah. they in turn tend to make um, inadequate mothers is what they call them. Yeah. Where they just like neglect their children or smack them around or just do all sorts of stuff because- their mother was 
an inanimate object. Yeah. Unethical stuff. Yeah, I feel like we owe the band Iron Maiden a big apology. Yeah, they're like, the, Roy, you gave us a bad name. Yeah, like, this was just supposed to be a torture device. <laughs> right. Not for animals, for exactly, humans. Exactly, yeah. Uh, I do. There's a cute salon slideshow called 20 Heartwarming Stories of Interspecies Adoptions. Oh, uh, that's literally the best thing on the internet. Isn't it sweet? Is when you find, like, a horse cuddling with a puppy. Right, or raising it as its own. Yeah. There's apparently a lioness who's well-known at in a preserve somewhere for um, stealing antelope calves and not eating them. I saw that, dude. But raising them as her own because she wants a kid. It's it's unbelievable. Yeah. Animals teaching us the way. <laughs> right. You know? Who could ever love a monkey? Like, who cares what you look like? Who cares what... what who cares if I'm meant to eat you? <laughs> you know, I'm gonna raise you as my own. Yeah. Well, they, I think they often display like true nurturing love more than a lot of humans do. Yeah. True that. Uh, if you guys want to know more about this kind of thing, you can type "animal imprinting" in the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com, and also go check out our classic episode, "Animal Domestication." Mm, good one. Pretty good. Um, and you can find that on StuffYouShouldKnow.com. And I said search bar in there somewhere, so it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this gang uh, article recommendation. Uh, Hi, guys. My name is Ciara. I just finished listening to How Street Gangs Work. I thought I would offer a piece of literature as a suggestion to people interested in reading more about the subject. It's called Gang Leader for a Day by Sudhir Vinkatesh. Uh, It's a sociological approach to street gangs in Chicago. started out as a Harvard dissertation with... Vintakesh asking, what's it like to be poor and black? And turned it into seven years of befriending a crack-dealing gang leader in the projects. It's a really great read. Very interesting to see a first-person account of gang life from someone who was not raised in the community in which gangs prevailed, especially when you learn that gangs started to protect uh, black people at its base level. So even when you see the gang violence brought forth in the book pages, you also get to see the gang members doing everything they can to protect their community members. Huh. Uh, the name, uh, there's a New York Times article, if you're interested, about the book called If You Want to Observe Them, Join Them. I think it was like 2008-ish. Mm-hmm. But I read it. It's awesome. Uh, so thanks for all the work you guys put into the episodes. I love constantly learning something new, except for when it's about space. I don't want to learn anything about space. Okay. <laughs> It'll make me lose my mind. Weird. Thank you, Ciara. Thank you, Ciara. Much appreciated. Go listen to our episode on the sun. Or the... Uh, that will make most people lose their minds. Elevator to the moon. Yeah. Or Mars. Or the moon. We've got a lot of them about <laughs> space. Yeah. She's like, yep, I've avoided them all. Um, we want to know what will make you lose your mind topic-wise. Or actually in general. Yeah, or if you've ever imprinted on uh, something non-human. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Gross. Uh, you can send us all that info via Twitter at SYSK Podcast. You can join us on Facebook.com slash Stuff You Should Know. You can send us an email to StuffPodcast at HowStuffWorks.com. And as always, join us at our home on the web, StuffYouShouldKnow.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com.
You may be surprised to learn that one of the best-selling poets in America today is a man who lived and died 800 years ago. The Persian-born Rumi, Jalal ad-Din Muhammad Rumi, to give him his full name, was a Sufi master who wrote ecstatic poems about love and joy and separation and pain. One respected scholar compares Rumi's work to Shakespeare for, and I quote, its resonance and beauty. Contemporary artists as diverse as Madonna and Philip Glass acknowledge their debt to him. He had two major bodies of work. The Masnavi was a huge didactic, mystical work. The Divan was a series of lyrical poems. But the popular editions of his work, much edited, contain little evidence of his Muslim origins. Has he been sanitised for a sensitive modern reader? Has his religion been removed from his poetry to help him become a more universal figure? Joining me to discuss the life and contemporary relevance of Rumi are Fatima Kashavars, Russian Chair in Persian Studies and Director of the School of Languages, Literatures and Cultures at the University of Maryland College Park. Alan Williams, Professor of Iranian Studies at the University of Manchester and British Academy Research Professor working on a new translation of Rumi. And Sharam Shiva, a Rumi translator and scholar for the past 25 years. Sharam, how important a figure is Rumi? Uh, Rumi has been a giant in the East from the time that he was alive and uh, He is historically a very important figure because his message is to transcend our differences. 
th- there is no better time for that message today. Fatima, why should we be interested in him specifically today? Because he touches on the issues that are at the heart of our lives, and he has done so over the centuries. And here in the West, we are just beginning to discover him. So um, it's very important to be able to see why everybody listened to him for such a long time. Alan, how did you become interested in Rumi? It was many years ago, over 40 years ago, when I was at university reading uh, classics and Persian and Arabic, and I found that Rumi gave me a new insight into Islam and into Sufism, the mysticism of Islam, but above all, into the meaning of poetry and how the poet worked. I'd like to look at his early life. Where was he born and who were his parents, Fatima? Well, he was um, born in uh, Vakhsh, just a little bit outside Balkh. Where is that? Uh, Balkh is in present-day Afghanistan. He was born in 1207, and um, his father was a renowned uh, mystic and scholar, somewhere around the age of maybe... um, seven or nine, we're not really sure about of his age. The family migrated westwards and went through many major urban areas in the Muslim world and finally settled in the city of Konya in present-day Turkey. So really he belongs to many, many different places and experienced a lot of cultures in the city of Konya also. There was a nice combination of um, Jews, Christians, Muslims, uh, Persian speakers, Turkish speakers. So it was a pretty vibrant and uh, exciting environment. It's generally accepted that his life turned round when he met a man called Shams Sharam. T- uh, tell me about Shams. Shams was a typical Persian dervish, and there is a long history of Persian dervishes. They don't have a place of residence. They're by choice wafers. And Shams was the opposite of Rumi because Rumi was an elite. And Rumi met Shams when uh, Rumi was about 38 years old and Shams was about 20 years or so older. These two opposing forces coming together is what generated the interest in Rumi into mysticism. And eventually when Shams was killed off, this point is controversial, that's when Rumi starts expressing himself in poetry. Fatima. Yes, he was a wayfarer, but he was also tremendously learned. So I'm not quite on the same page with one being very learned and the other one being opposed to it or very different. It it was a very intense relationship, Alan. What do you make of it? What was it about this relationship that was so special? I would say that Shams Adin, uh, Shamsi Tabriz, uh, transformed Rumi's spiritual life, it's said, by cooking and burning it. That's to say he took him to deeper levels of experience. He was a man of profound spiritual attainment, and I think this made all the difference to Rumi, whose spirituality uh, became deepened and set alight. Fatima, what was the essence of the relationship? What was, what was it about it? Was it a physical relationship? You know, I personally don't believe so, because we know that Shams married Rumi's daughter or adopted daughter. But, you know, to me, that question is totally irrelevant. (laughs) Their relationship was much deeper than anything physical or spiritual. They just saw something together that uh, transformed him. What happened to Shams? Because there were rumors that he was murdered. He once left, and Rumi's friends went and brought him back, and the second time he disappeared. We don't really know what happened to him. It is possible that he was killed by Rumi's disciples, even the involvement of one of his sons, who were jealous of the kind of close relationship they had. And it is also possible that he just simply disappeared. He was a wandering dervish, after all. So it's a quite extraordinary story. Uh, Rumi meets Shams, they have a relationship for two and a half years, and out of that emerges a spiritual deepening in Rumi and this wonderful poetry. Now, I want to talk about the poetry, Alan. What is it like? A huge variety. There's a great variety and there's a great deal of it. Uh, He's one of the most prolific poets in Persian language. In fact, in any language, uh, he wrote 
35,000 couplets of lyric poetry and of quite a different order he wrote uh, one of the longest mystical epics that we have in world literature, the Masnavi, and they are extraordinarily different and yet they're stamped by something that runs through them. One of those things, I think, is the intense wit of (laughs) Rumi. His intelligence is really very striking. What we have is a poet who who truly matured in his lifetime. The Masnavi is a very mature work. The the lyric poems are much shorter, like sonnets, and uh, have a sort of fiery intensity, whereas the Masnavi is is rather like a, a great range of mountains. Give me a couple of famous quotes, Fatima. He has this description of love. He wants to show us that love is an absence. Love shows itself in the way the heart weeps, for no ailment is like the suffering of the heart, which is why all love, whether of this world or the next, lead us in the end to the palace of the king. I talk and talk to describe, demystify love, then I come to love. What a poor job I've done. As the pen ran faster and faster to write, it reached the word love and broke down. Love was of the essence of his poetry, was it not? Absolutely. But also his poetry is an encounter. He's not just talking to himself. He's telling us life is about action. It's not about reading intellectual development alone. It's about living it. He, he's interpreted as a Sufi, and I suppose at this point in the programme we really should define what a Sufi is. Sharam? Sufi is a mystic of Islam. The experience of a Sufi is very similar to the experience of a mystical Hindu or a mystical Christian. The concept is to to experience what spirituality and religion try to convey to people, meaning to rise above the written words. And you can be a Shia or a Sunni and a Sufi? Uh, Yes, you can. Do you think Rumi was a Sufi, Fatima? Not in the traditional sense of the term. He never was the director of the order... He was never doing it in the sense that the traditional Sufis did. But he spoke about having God inside us, having that direct connection with God and being able to be one with God. Literally, he said, our bodies is like a Mary and God is the Jesus we carry. We're pregnant with God and we give birth to it. And that's the essence of what Sufism says. Alan, what do you make of that? Was he a Sufi? In one sense, of course. In another sense, he is one of those writers who transcends and defies definition. My whole approach to Rumi is not so much to talk about the man or even his life, and in that sense I see his biography as being 